Um, welcome to another episode of Stockport Motor School Talk Sport. Today's guest is Stockport born and bred. Um, he works in the world of professional sport as a professional sports photographer. Uh, most, most notably, he works in the NBA. Um, but recent, more recently, he's been selected to be an official photographer at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. So welcome aboard, Stephen Gosling. How are you doing? Very well. Good morning. Good stuff. You're trying to keep that last one a secret from me because you didn't mention that. So I have to mention I, I heard about it on Wednesday. Yeah, amazing. Um, Congratulations. So, yeah, fingers crossed it doesn't get postponed again and everything goes ahead. But, yeah, no, that, was a, that was a big shock. No, congratulations. Well done. All right, we'll, we'll get cracking then. So, first of all, do you just want to give a little bit of a brief introduction about your journey and where you've come from, from Stockport to, to where you are today in, in Washington? Sure. Um, so, uh, so I'm born and bred in Stockport. I was born in Stephen Hill Hospital. I grew up on Lowndes Lane, which is just off Milan Lane. Uh, I went to uh, Stockport School, so Mile End. I went across the street. Yeah. Uh, I sort of discovered photography when I was 15. Um, I did a uh, Duke of Edinburgh's award. Yeah. Um, and we did our um, like expedition, like with, to get the the final Duke of Edinburgh award thing, you have to do uh, like a, a trip somewhere. And so we, our group went to Spain, we went to uh, Mallorca to climb some mountains. And I'd always been interested in photography and I used it as an excuse to buy a camera and take it with me uh, to take photographs. And uh, I, I basically knew then that that was what I wanted to do. Um, so then I, um, got an A-level in photography. I did my A-levels at Aquinas College. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to Stockport College to get a BTEC art diploma, which you have to get to do an art degree. And then, so I have a, a documentary and fine art photography degree from the University of Liverpool. Yeah. And, but I only went to the University of Liverpool for one day. My degree was all done at Stockport College. Yeah. And I went to the University of Liverpool for graduation. <laughs> so that was it. Uh, and then I, I emigrated to the States uh, right after graduation. So I was 22, uh, lived in New York for a little bit, um, and then moved down here to DC. And I was very lucky. It was like a right time, right place sort of moment that uh, one of the first gigs that I booked was assisting at the WNBA All-Star Game, so the Women's National Basketball Association. So the all-star game that year was here in DC and I got hired by a photographer just to assist her for four days as she was doing portraits of players uh, that were at the all-star game. And then the Washington Wizards replaced their team photographer with a guy that I had met during all-star and he remembered me and he brought me along to work with him. And now we're 14 seasons later. Wow. No, so it really? was just right place, right time. Yeah, what a journey so far. Um, I'd just like to touch on a little bit about, obviously, 22-year-old year moving across the world. How, how did that come about? So I, I, I met a girl. Uh, so I did Camp America yeah. when I was 19. Um, so I was a, a camp counselor at a summer camp in Oxford, Pennsylvania. And the camp that I was at also recruited from uh, a college in Ohio. And uh, I, I met my wife there. Um, and we sort of knew right away that we were going to be together. So uh, two years of long distance whilst I finished university because I was only uh, halfway through. Uh, so went through the process of getting a fiance visa, uh, multiple trips back and forth over two years. Uh, we got married a month after I graduated. So we got married on my birthday in August of 2006. And then here we are 14 and a half years later, uh, still married, so it worked out. Uh, but like it was never a plan to move to America but then you know Camp America happened and I met my wife and we just knew we were going to be together and then so 
I moved over here and here I am. Oh, cool. And a lot of things, actually, on, on this series we've been talking to, a lot of the people, they've experienced different cultures and been to different countries. How, how do you think that's benefited you in your your field? In your field? It's, I feel like it certainly made me slightly more memorable. Um, you know, if, if someone's worked with, you know, a number of photographers or just a number of people, they might remember, you know, the English photographer a little bit more. Um, so, like, I, I definitely feel like I've booked work maybe because I was slightly more memorable just because I was different. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, maybe not, um, but, you know, I feel like maybe it has. Yeah. Um, uh, we're talking a lot about on this series about high-performance mindset, and, again, we're big believers here at Stockport that you don't need elite talent to have an elite mindset, and if you have that mindset, you're going to do great, great things uh, if you do the, the simple things right. So what makes high-performance to Stephen Gosling? uh preparation mm -hmm. which is uh interesting for me to talk about because i can be very lazy um <laughs> but if it's important then i i definitely try not to be um but yeah it's it's a lot about preparation specifically with photography um you know researching your subject so not necessarily like the action sports side but so i have to then do a lot of portrait work with um athletes and just because i'm in washington dc i tend to work a lot with politicians and corporate ceos um but so they usually can't give you a lot of time so if i'm doing you know a portrait shoot with an athlete they can maybe give me two three minutes yeah. so everything has to be perfect when they arrive like i can't have have them arrive and then be you know, fiddling with the lights and fiddling with my camera settings because I might be eating up two thirds of the time I have with them. And so then I'm creating less because I'm still preparing whilst they're there. Um, so it's a, like preparation, just getting your gear in the right place, everything being charged, you know, memory cards in the camera being, you know, fully erased and ready to go. All your camera settings perfectly set and ready to go. But then also having something to talk about with them. So I'll usually do a little bit of research about each subject yeah. just so I can talk to them. So the way that I uh, shoot portraits is I chat. And then because if I just say, okay, smile, not yeah. everyone's going to do it. You know, not everyone's that comfortable in front of the camera right away. So I usually just, you know, I'll try and find out something about, you know, them, their family, hobbies that they might have just so i can make them comfortable and get them chatting yeah. um so it's you know preparation in terms of equipment and then also the person um so that's what i would say is uh high performance is uh yeah is being being ready basically no i think that's that's a really really important message across anything you do isn't it be prepared what you're going to do and do your homework and that, that's really really useful and in, in terms obviously you've come across top top level athletes and top level politicians and ceos is anybody in particular you don't have to mention any names you you've come away thinking i've learned that today there's anything that's come off out from that so i do some work for a, a non-profit uh a climbing or it's a an outdoor nonprofit, we'll say it's called the access fund mm -hmm. and so part of what they do is they secure access to public land for climbers yeah. and so i've i've met alex honnold a couple of times and photographed him and uh people might know him from uh the documentary that came out a couple of years ago called free solo where he climbed the side of el cap in yosemite mm -hmm. uh without a rope you know, so if he falls off, he dies. Um, he is the most single minded person I've ever met. He just lives and breathes climbing. Um, so like I followed him around where so they were going to Capitol Hill and they were lobbying uh, politicians, you know, trying to get what they want. So this access to public land. And then so I'm following him around and in waiting rooms before we go in, he's just there chatting with other climbers and, you know, the people, uh, the staffers in the office and just 
like people will be asking him about, oh, you know, like, what are you climbing next? And he's literally describing each hold on a climb. And he's like, okay, so this one is here. And then you're going to move to this dyno and then this. And then, and he just could memorize 3,000 feet of climbing, which is hundreds of moves. And he knows them all because he's done them so much and he's so dedicated to it. So his, his single mindedness really, um affected me uh like that's that's dedication and so that that uh that was very interesting to me no awesome that's really good and then linking on a little bit talking about people who've influenced you in your journey uh, have you got anyone that that stands out and, and and why um so it's you know i'm sure everyone credits their parents and it's kind of sappy um but so i'm going to credit my parents in a low key way because they never pushed me in any direction. Yeah. There was never, you know, you have to go to university, you have to do this, you have to do that. They just left me alone to figure out what I wanted to do. And then when I, you know, came back and was like, I want to do this, they're just like, okay, you know, yeah. let's, you know, figure out a way to do it and get it done. You know, because I was, uh, when I was in high school, I was good at maths. And so um, I think we thought I was maybe going to be an accountant or something. And then I, got bad at maths or uh, I did my maths GCSE a year early and then I didn't do maths for a year. Yeah. And then when I tried to then pick it back up at A level, I'd literally forgotten everything. Um, yeah. So that went out the window, uh, <laughs> which is all good. Um, but then someone was like, oh, I want to go to art school and I want to do this and I want to do that. It was just like, okay, you know, like figure out where you're going to go and, you know, make sure, you know, you have a part-time job so you can, afford to buy the things you need to buy um so i'll credit my uh my parents for that and then um just other photographers so it's like not necessarily ones that i've met but just other photographers who i've studied along the way uh, there is one photographer who uh, was a few years ahead of me at stockport college uh called lloyd bishop who was a wonderful um portrait photographer and uh he is the the chief photographer for the Seth Meyers show, which is a TV show here in the States in New York. Um, and he does a lot of great behind the scenes documentary work. Um, and so um, like we've had a, a good number of conversations over the years and we keep in touch. So he's affected my work um, just cause I think, so the photographers that affect me are better than me. Uh, so he's a much better photographer than I am. Uh, and so like, I like to look at his work often uh, for it to sort of, uh, uh, hopefully influence and progress mine. Uh, but then the other the other MBA photographer that I work with in DC has basically taught me everything I know about shooting basketball. Yeah. Uh, he's a photographer called Ned Dishman. He's from New York. Um, and then just the other MBA photographers that I'm aware of and I'm around. So, you know, Andy Bernstein from LA and Nat Butler in New York. Yeah, that's good. And he, he, obviously what comes across there is you pick in the best of different people you're not trying to copy anybody but you're trying to be the best version of you and you kind of steal different cherry things. pick yeah. yeah cherry pick like their their skills and see how it can help progress mine yeah no i think that's really really important that's good no, good stuff and then we'll talk about obviously ups and downs and uh, on people's careers um have you had any setbacks that have um hit you and, and what and if you have had them setbacks what did you do to overcome them that's an interesting one. Um, so, setbacks. So, potentially two avenues. Um, so, number one, uh, my my body hates me. Um, so, like, so right, so like, I so currently I'm in this this arm brace because I tore a tendon in my elbow, um, and kind of like weirdly because of the way that we have to shoot now because of COVID. Yeah. Uh, I'm in a different position than I would normally be. And so right now I'm actually able to use a tripod uh, so I can still shoot because I'm not having to hold any of the weight. Um, but also like four years ago, I had back surgery. I have a spinal fusion uh, in my lower back just because like randomly one of my vertebrates was growing a bone spur. It was no accident. I wasn't in a car crash or anything. Um, I was just experiencing back pain. Uh, but so the setback there being like number one, like it hurt like hell. But number two, I had to take 10 weeks off from shooting. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my, you know, I'm 
fully self-employed, uh, you know, I am my own business. So I had to not work for 10 weeks. And so my income dipped that year, mm -hmm. uh, as well as then I have to pay for the surgery because healthcare isn't free in this sure. country. But that's a separate conversation. Um, <laughs> and then, so like, but then like career-wise, like I've had, I've had corporate clients that I've lost. Mm -hmm. um, usually, um, I sort of ma maintain relationships with like a creative director or a marketing director or something like that. And then if they move jobs, you know, a new person comes and works for that company and they might have a prior relationship with a different photographer that they've worked with previously. And yeah. so I've gained clients that way when I, you know, they are new, you know, when they've moved jobs, they've brought me along. Um, and then I've lost, you know, good clients the same way. So that's always a setback. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm by no means perfect. I've had people, you know, not like, um, like photographs that I've taken or not liked, you know, the imagery that I've produced. And so then it's about, you know, just being able to swallow your pride and, you know, ask for feedback, you know, like, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? And then to fix it for the future. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that can happen in anything, doesn't it? Like, it can be just people's opinions. And with some last yeah. years, they may do something and they think they've done the best possible, but actually somebody doesn't like it. And yeah, what, what, what advice would you give to those, those people there? So like, it's, I guess, like swallowing your pride, like, and it's hurtful. Mm. Um, you know, like I've had it, had it happen to me. And it's like, where like, I felt like I did a good job. And so I didn't understand, but so it's, it's to move past the, you know, like I did a good job. It's fine. It's like, you know, they didn't enjoy it. So, you know, didn't appreciate the product you were giving them for whatever reason. And to just try and see it from their point of view and then to, you know, augment that for the future. So then, you know, you might lose that client, they might give you a second chance, and then to try and change what you did, you know, in the future. And it might just, it might not even be like the, you know, from my point of view, it might not be like the images, it might be the way they were delivered, the timing, mm -hmm. uh, like just, and it might even just be a personality thing. Maybe I was too, you know, too friendly or not friendly enough. Um, but it's, um, it's, I think it's important to ask for feedback so that you can sort of understand how they're interpreting what you're giving them yeah no definitely and it's and it's also trying to turn that that set back into a positive isn't it and that's where you see yeah that, that feedback and how can i get better i might have in their eyes failed but actually no it's just a stepping stone of learning in a different way yeah and they can then and alternatively there have been clients where I, I feel like I've not done a good job or I felt like I could have given them a better image yeah. and they've done nothing but praise what I've given them. And so I'm not going to be like, no, I could have done that better. I'm yeah. just going to make that note to myself about what I feel like I didn't do best because I wasn't pleased and I want to make sure that I'm pleased with what I'm giving them. On the flip side, Stephen, you've had many accomplishments so far. Um, what are you most proud of? um to date and why so, oh, accomplishments are a hard thing to talk about yeah because i like i, I don't like to try and uh, like toot my own horn uh too much as it were um but like the olympics thing was very cool uh, that was a really big um i feel like like that i feel like that's an accomplishment so i really am hoping they're going ahead um so just to be selected so like um the NBA has this uh, agreement with USA Basketball where they provide the photographers. So I'll be going to uh, hopefully to the Olympics with USA Basketball and shooting the men's and women's teams, as well as um, some select other teams that just have like high level NBA talent. So obviously like uh, Luka Doncic, uh, who I think is Slovenian. I hope I'm not getting that wrong. Um, uh, and that, like Rui Hachimura, who's a wizard, uh, will be playing for Japan. Um, so like that would be a, a big one to shoot as well. Um, so I like that's a, a big accomplishment to be selected for that. Um, but then also this past summer, uh, the NBA season and the WNBA season had to be uh, finished and played in bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, so I was one of two photographers that was selected to 
shoot the entire uh, WNBA season, which was shot in Florida. So I, you know, lived in a hotel for three months and photographed three basketball or two to three basketball games a day, uh, every day for six days a week. Um, and so just being select, so like for the league to consider me good enough to go and do that and for them to trust me, uh, I feel like is a big accomplishment. Uh, but then also just, excuse me, um, you know, moving to this country and not knowing anyone other than my wife, um, you know, and moving to DC and which my wife is not from DC. Like we didn't know anyone here. My wife had a cousin who lived here, but that was it. Uh, just you know, starting my business and, you know, increasing profits year on year um, is a is a boring accomplishment, but I feel like an important one. Yeah. And yeah. like sort of a, as like with, um, you know, current things as they are with COVID, a lot of photographers are struggling, you know, like event photographers, wedding photographers obviously can't shoot. Mm. Um, portrait photographers have to augment how they shoot and they can no longer get close to their subjects or they shouldn't be, um, you know, and if they are, it's, you know, with masks and social distancing and whatever else they can do. Um, so, but I, you know, I've been lucky that my business has not really suffered. Um, so I feel like that's slightly an accomplishment, but that's more so just because the NBA continued, uh, which was good. And then this is going off, off piece a little bit. Have you got one image that that is your favorite image you should you should oh. no so you choose one? No, I don't I don't have so I don't I have like I have images I'm proud of. Yeah. Um or like images I remember. And it's um like this so there's one there's one wizard's photo from a few years ago um so it was uh but and it wasn't even like an action shot it was a celebration shot and so i was just lucky that the player turned towards me to celebrate and he just literally like screams and so that was the first photo of mine that was ever used on a billboard wow. so that was on a billboard outside the arena you know however many dozens of feet wide and tall so that's the biggest you know printing one of my images has ever been printed um, so like that's one that just sticks out in my mind. But um how how did I that make like you feel, Stephen? So how how did that make you feel when you walked to the stadium and you saw that image, you took that photo? What was going through your head then? I just, like it was like a like it's it's like I can feel my cheeks raising. It just yeah. made me smile. It was like it was sort of a uh just like a little bit of recognition, like, oh, I'm doing a good job. Yeah. You know, these images are uh, it's always just very gratifying to see your images being used. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even like from a small client to a big client, you know, like I'll be scrolling Instagram and I'll see like, oh, they used my my photo from this game yeah. uh, that I photographed or, you know, this client really likes this portrait and they're using that image a lot. And so it's it's just always gratifying just to see your images being used. Yeah. Um, it's like I've, like I've taken uh, photographs of, um, like two presidents, uh, multiple congressmen and senators. So there would be like MPs, members of parliament. Um, and it's more so I remember shooting it mm -hmm. and like the, like the feeling I got shooting something that, you know, because that they're, you know, a public figure or, you know, an, an important person, like knowing that that image is also like a historical record. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's sort of it's very gratifying to know that like my images could be used for a long time yeah well, that's really really good uh, and then we've touched upon this next question before uh, when you talked about uh, uh the, the free solo uh, climb have you got any specific examples of sporting stars that have had a long lasting impact on you so would you taken a photo of them that you walked away thinking yeah i learned that today or that that impression so it's not necessarily that like because I took the photo of them, um, mm -hmm. but so like uh, the WNBA, so particularly being around all of the WNBA players a lot this summer, you sort of learn how like underappreciated they are, which is very, very sad. Yeah. Um, you know, 
and I think that's true for a lot of women's sports in general. If you look at, you know, women's soccer, uh, you know, women's basketball, um, it's they're they're often put at a lower level than you know men's teams or men's athletes, mm-hmm. and so watching them, you know, up close this summer, just not only play the sport at such a high level, but also just with you know how much grace and professionalism they approach their job Mm -hmm. um was very inspiring um you know so and and it was also just very interesting because like we lived in the same hotel with these 144 professional athletes and so we got to know them uh much more than we would normally have and so then just being that much closer to them um i think really had like that's going to be an experience I remember, you know, for the rest of my life. Um, But then also, you know, like the, like the wizards players that I interact with, like you sort of just realize that they're normal people. Like, yes, they're, you know, they can be multimillionaires because they're, you know, they're at the top of their game and the top of the league um, in terms of, you know, skill. But like, so like Bradley Beal, who is, um, uh, one of the more high-profile Washington Wizards players. He just got voted uh, onto the All-Star team this week as an All-Star starter. Um, like I was talking to him on Media Day this year. So Media Day is when we do portraits of all the players. And I was just asking him about his kids and because he's got two young boys. And like he was telling me about like um, like what they like to do. Mm-hmm. And how big his smile got because of it yeah. was, and, and I was telling him, I was like, you know, like we've been talking for like 10 minutes and I asked you about your kids and you just smiled really big. And it's like, they're just, I guess so it's nothing to do with the fact that I took his photo. It's just that they treat you as an equal because yeah. you are, it's like, yeah. yes, they're famous or yes, they're very wealthy because of what they do and how good they are at doing it, but they're just people, you know? And yeah. You know, as long as you show respect to them and don't treat them in a certain way, you know, so it's like, I don't ask players for anything. I don't ask them for favors. I don't ask them for autographs. You know, that's, that would be inappropriate. Um, You know, and that's me trying to get something from them. Um, So I just, you know, treat them as a friend. Um, And I hope that then, you know, they would then treat me the same and, you know, 99% of them do. And then, and then that stays with you because it's, and you've got this relationship with them. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I think that's really, really important. Like I said, like you said, they're just normal people, aren't they? They're people who have got a, a talent, but also when we're talking about this mindset, they've got that elite mindset as well. So that's, that's the only difference really. Uh, yeah. Which is good. No, awesome. And then we're asking everybody these last two questions. Um, so this, this next question is, what what are your three non-negotiable behaviours you'd expect from yourself or anybody you'd come into contact with? Uh, so professionalism. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, just, you know, when you're dealing with a subject, you know, just... <laughs> like being open and clear about what you're asking them, you know, what you want them to do to then, you know, if it's a portrait, you know, to get the best result, um, you know, but again, like don't be asking for favors, don't be asking for things. Uh, timing, which sort of goes along with professionalism um, and sort of what I was like, if it's a really important person, they might only be able to give you, you know, one minute. Um, and so you have to be ready to go. So like, I'm always, always early. You know, like you might have a call time, you know, it's like, you know, like, the, you know, maybe you've been told, okay, the subject will be with you at 10 o'clock, but maybe something happens and they have to go somewhere else at 10 o'clock. So they arrive at 930, you know, so being early and being able to adapt um, and sort of roll with the punches, especially with, um, you know, high level people um, is a good, a good skill to have. And then just uh, like, for me, it's knowing my equipment and having backups. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if I do have to change something, you know, because, you know, either it's not right or it breaks, uh, being able to do it quickly so that you, again, just rolling with the punches, you know, so I spend a lot of time, 
um, especially when it's a new piece of equipment that I buy or that I use, uh, just sort of like learning it in and out, you know, reading the manual, pressing every button yeah. uh, and just knowing what it does and how it does it so that I can use it to the best of its ability. Yeah, no, good. And those three, yeah, you said there, don't just relate to your role. It relates to a lot of things in life, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I hate being late for appointments. It gives me anxiety. I'm always the person that's like 20 to 30 minutes early for the dentist. I'm happy just sitting in the waiting room. I will read a magazine. But if I was one minute late, I would just, I would hate it. Uh, and then last one from me then. So if you could go back uh, to being a 12-year-old boy, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, invest in Google. <laughs> well, you know, that would be step one. Uh, um, I don't know. Like, so like at 12, like, I didn't know what I wanted to do at 12. Yeah. Um, I, so like at 12, like being that young or, you know, not even necessarily at 12, but just being open uh, to like lots of different things and don't try and pigeonhole yourself quite so young try lots of different things, learn as much about them as you can, and then, you know, find what it is you like to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what you're good at and what will help you, you know, contribute something, um, you know, so, you know, whether it be, you know, I know we're, we're talking about sports specific things, but so, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, you know, photography, uh, you know, so sort of just thinking about like with the Wizards, you know, they have a social media team and their social media team also works with graphic designers and the marketing team. Yeah. You know, so you don't have to specifically be, you know, an athlete or an athlete agent or a trainer, a coach. But, you know, so just in terms of like the the imagery or the art side, you know, there's photography, graphics, website design, the social media team. There's just lots of different things you can do within a sports world. Yeah. Um, so, you know, try lots of different things and sort of see what you're good at, see what you like to do. No, that's great advice. And that's that's something I always stress to the students that in sport, there's every industry in sport. I, I can't think of any industry where there isn't something you can go into. Um, so that's it, definitely.